Ooh, that was beautiful. Uh, that was from YouTube. That was a cello and guitar duet. Good morning. We welcome you in worship today. It's a little snowy out there, but uh, other than that, it's a beautiful day to be worshiping our Lord. <clears throat> um, I want to give thanks to all of you who have been remembering your church with your financial contributions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, it is a time of Lent, a time when we examine who we are in our faith, a time when we prepare our hearts for uh, the resurrection of Christ and the gift of eternal life that Christ offers to all of us. So it's a time of self-examination, a time to do away with those things in our lives that hold us down and that would keep us from being jubilant Christ-like people. So as we continue in our Lenten time, uh, we give thanks to each of you for your presence with us in this worship service and for your gifts honoring our Lord. <clears throat> Um, normally I would do this under prayer requests, but I, I just want to <clears throat> um, let you all know that you've been praying for me and my family, and I really appreciate your prayers. We have felt them, and um, we are, are all doing well. I am recording from home this morning because I'm in a time of self-isolation because uh, my daughter Jenny and her husband Joe and their new baby were all exposed to COVID. However, every single, I mean all three of them have had the COVID test and all three are negative. So I'm assuming that means that I'm negative as well because if they don't have it, then how could they have exposed me? But I am still worship or not worshiping. Well, I am worshiping from home, but I am recording the worship service from home just to be safe. Um, <clears throat> but we want to thank you all for your gifts of prayer that you sent to us when our granddaughter was in the hospital. It was just a virus of some kind. Um, they were doing tests to find out if it was a bacterial virus and or what kind of virus it is, but it was one of those that I guess just has to work through your body. And so she is perfectly fine now. Uh, they're, of course, they were only in the hospital overnight last Monday, but uh, everybody's home, uh, everybody's feeling good, everybody's fine. I'm fine, my husband and son are fine, so I want to give thanks to God for that. And then later on, when we go to prayer requests, I will ask you to pray for my son-in-law Joe's family, uh, because they were all exposed and numerous ones have come down with it. But we'll get to that a little bit later on under prayer requests. <clears throat> so welcome, and let us continue in the worship of our Lord. Our first hymn is Sing Praise to God Who Reigns Above. If you have your hymnal handy, it is on page 126. And of course, if you don't, the words will appear on the screen.
And now will you join with me in our call to celebration. Worship God, who is from everlasting to everlasting. The God of creation does not faint or grow weary. Sing praise to God with great thanksgiving. We praise God with the best we have to offer. And now will you join with me in our community prayer. Compassionate Savior, at whose touch people are healed and by whose word lives are transformed, show yourself to us now. Touch our lives. Speak to us. We do not seek these gifts for ourselves alone, but for the sake of the gospel. May your message be proclaimed among all people, drawing us all into the community you intend, where God reigns and love prevails. Amen. Our special music is What Does the Lord Require of You? It's sort of a round kind of song, but I have printed the words um, so that you can understand what they are saying. But it's a beautiful song, and let us listen to this song in a worshipful manner.
As we go to a time of prayer this morning, I know that there are folks on your own hearts that are in need of your prayers. Perhaps you have friends or family members that need your prayers, and this is the time when we can lift them up in our own hearts and minds. I don't know of anybody in our congregation that uh, has contacted me and asked for prayers, so I have nothing like that to share with you this morning. I would ask that you pray for my son-in-law Joe's family. Um, <clears throat> they had one member of the family who had COVID but did not know it when they had a family dinner. And uh, so now nine people in the family total are, po are positive. Uh, we worry because we've got some with uh, compromised health issues. And then there are three infants in the family who live with people who are positive. And so <clears throat> we're very concerned for all of those folks who have all been exposed. I know that this family is not the only family out there that is struggling with COVID. I am so grateful for the vaccines that have been developed through our scientists and through our medical community. I can't stress enough how important it is to get vaccinated. <clears throat> it keeps you healthy and keeps you from getting it and therefore continuing this pandemic. Every single one of us needs to do our part in wearing our masks, in participating in social distancing, and in getting vaccinated for the health of us all. <clears throat> so I would urge you to uh, continue to do all that you can to keep yourself and others healthy. Let's lift up our healthcare workers who have worked for a year now tirelessly. Well, maybe not. Maybe they do get awfully, awfully tired, but they have been very, very dedicated to keeping you and I safe. You and me, I guess, proper English. You and me safe. Um, we just uh, really need to support them and to give thanks to God for them and their uh, acts of mercy and their uh, dedication to what they do. Let us take a moment now and silently pray. Good morning, Lord. God of us all, in your unfailing love and goodness, hear us as we bring to you our prayers for the world and for all people. In this period of Lent, we come to you aware of our unreadiness for the enormity of the Easter message that Christ suffered and died for us, and was yet raised in glorious victory. Grant us healing in our souls, Lord, and in the souls of all who search for meaning in their lives. We pray for the health and vigor of your church on earth, for all who preach your gospel and have responsibly the responsibility of, of caring for souls. We pray for those churches that struggle to keep their doors open in an era when attendance at worship is poor. Grant them willing hands and sufficient funds to maintain regular worship to your glory. We thank you, O oh God, for your many miracles of healing. And we pray for all who work with the sick and infirm. We name in our hearts those we love who are in need of your healing touch. We pray that your blessing be upon them and those who love and care for them 
and we pray that they may find encouragement and peace, that their sorrows and concerns be transformed into comfort and their loneliness into fellowship with you. Bless us as a people who strive to spread the gospel of peace. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our hymn is He Leadeth Me on page 128 of your hymnals, or the words will appear on the screen. As we are in this Lenten time, 
We are so grateful for all of the offerings that we have received. We are grateful for each of you sending in contributions, um, remembering your church, so that when we open, there will be a time um, when we can truly give thanksgiving and see one another's faces. On that note, I want to let you know that we are planning on having an outdoor Easter service in person. Um, so we're going to do it in the Rose Garden, weather permitting. That's the only thing that would prevent us from having Easter outside. We're going to do it at 1 o'clock in the afternoon on Easter Sunday so that it will be a little bit warmer because the parameters that we've set on being able to do this is that it, it has to be above 60 degrees in the Rose Garden. Um, so we don't want to freeze, none of us. We don't want you all sitting there in your chairs, just like we did last fall, where you bring your own chair and then take it back with you home. Uh, we don't want you freezing. We don't want the musicians' fingers freezing while they're trying to play their instruments. And I don't want to shiver while I'm preaching. So um, if it's below 60 degrees, we would have to cancel, unfortunately. But... Um, and also, if it's precipitating in some way, raining or snowing, then, of course, we none of us want to be out there being wet. So, um, I'm going to send you an email this week about that, so get ready for the email. But uh, at this time, let us give thanks for your gifts among us. Will you join with me in the prayer of dedication? Thank you, God for showing us a better way to live than we are able to devise for ourselves. Thank you for reaching out to win our hearts. Thank you for Jesus Christ, whose presence offered wholeness to those who were sick or brokenhearted, for the prayers that demonstrated how we too can be in communion with you. In gratitude, we dedicate this offering. Amen. Our scripture lesson for today is taken from the Gospel according to Mark, chapter 5, verses 24 through 34. Listen for the word of God. A large crowd followed Jesus and pressed in on him. Now there was a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years. She had endured much under many physicians and had spent all that she had. And she was no better, but rather grew worse. She had heard about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. For she said, if I but touch his clothes, I will be made well. Immediately her hemorrhage stopped and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. Immediately aware that power had gone forth from him, Jesus turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? And his disciples said to him, you see the crowd pressing in on you, and yet how can you say, who touched me? He looked all around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling, fell down before him, and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace, and be healed of your disease. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. As many of you are aware, we have a pretty impressive museum right here in Denver 
called the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. When my children were in elementary school, I accompanied their classes on several field trips to the museum. And one of the displays that they had at one point was, it was some sort of electromagnetic machine. The kids loved it because it made you look funny. And this is how it worked. One or two people at a time would go up and put their hand on this electromagnetic contraption and it would start sending electricity through their body. And then eventually the electricity would build up to the point that it made people's hair stand on end. And there's another example that I would like to share with you and it's some sort of a lamp. Maybe you've seen them in people's homes or maybe in novelty stores or something like that. But when you put your hand near the lamp, these lines of electricity, these jagged lines come out of the lamp and they touch your hand wherever you move your hand to. And it looks like a weird kind of science experiment of some sort. Well, certainly that's a very obvious example of the power of touch. But touch is powerful for all kinds of reasons, isn't it? For years, psychologists have tried to speculate how children might develop if they were completely cut off from human relationships. And tragically, they had an opportunity to, to, uh, to uh, observe just that kind of phenomenon in the 1980s when numerous orphanages in communist Romania were opened to the world's eyes after their dictator uh, fell from power. This dictator had mandated these bizarre social policies that had resulted in thousands of unwanted children. And many of these children ended up in vast, underfunded, state-run orphanages where they were completely isolated. They often received no love, and in fact, they didn't have any human touch really at all. Sadly, although the children grew into physical human creatures, they did not become human persons. They couldn't speak. They couldn't relate at all to others. And they couldn't give or receive affection. All because they'd never been touched. They never had been loved. Well, we all know the reassuring and healing power of touch in our own lives, don't we? We know how reassuring it is for someone to hold our hand when we're trying to hold back the tears. And we know how comforting it is to be hugged at the end of, the, of a long, bad day. And we all know the joy that comes when we can greet our children and our spouse with a morning hug or a goodnight kiss. And I'm sure that we've all become so accustomed to touch that there are times when, you know, actually we don't even think about it. We don't think about what's happening. But if it, if it was, were stopped altogether, I think we would certainly notice, wouldn't we? I think we all notice right now that in the midst of the COVID outbreak, we're feeling the effects of not having any touch. And I know that we're saying that not only can we wait until we can touch one another again, uh, but we all miss the hugs, we miss the touch, we miss seeing one another, we miss the human interaction of our church and our church family. Touch really does have the power to heal us, to change us, to restore us, and even transform us. And this woman in our scripture for today, who'd been bleeding for 12 years, knew that. 
So let's take a moment to learn a bit more about this woman. She's at the center of today's scripture passage. Well, the Bible doesn't really give us this woman's name. We don't know anything about her family, and that may well be because she's been separated from them. Her continual bleeding has made her ritually unclean, which means that she was likely separated from her family, um, not to mention the rest of society. She lived in some sort of community outside the bounds of her town. And Matthew's statement says that she spent everything that she had without getting any better. And that would imply that she was a woman of at least some means, but she was made poor in all of her efforts to end her affliction. And she wants to stop this physical pain, this suffering. But I'm sure that she's also ready to be a part of society again. She's ready to go f fetch water at the well with the other women. And she's ready now to, to fix meals for her children and her family and to sleep in the same household as her husband every night. Could you imagine how you might feel if you were suffering from such an illness and your family couldn't even be near you to take care of you, to comfort you in your pain. It's kind of like right now with COVID, uh, where those who are going into the hospital are not able to have their family visit them. They are in there having only the company of the nurses who are providing care for them. No one's there to comfort them in their pain from their own family and their loved ones. Well, I think if you were this woman in their scripture for today who felt very much like that, very isolated, I think you'd be anxious to get well too. So I imagine but that by the time we meet this woman, she's to the point where she's willing to give anything a try. An effort quite literally to stop the bleeding. And she's gotten word that this healer named Jesus is coming to town. And of course, everyone else in town has gotten that word as well. So Jesus, as he makes his way through the town, the crowds just press in on him. They're around him and he's among them. And it doesn't matter that to this woman that if she walks around, it probably causes her great discomfort. And it doesn't matter that she's not even supposed to be around all of these other people, much less touching them as the crowd presses in around them. But she's a total outcast. But none of these things stop this woman. She knows that if she can just just place one finger on Jesus' garment just to reach out and touch him, that her bleeding will stop. And this, my friends, is faith at its highest level. The writer of Hebrews teaches us that faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not yet seen. And if we put that statement into this whole story from Matthew, what we might see is that the faith is the knowledge of things hoped for. So this woman knows that she can get close to Jesus, and if she can just have one touch from him, that's all she needs. That touch will stop the bleeding. That touch will cure her physical malady. It will restore her to all of society. This is the touch she knows that will finally heal her. And when she touches Jesus, immediately her bleeding stops. And in the same moment, Jesus feels power go out from him. 
and he turns to see who touched him. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? This woman's faith was so strong that Jesus felt the power of it when she touched him. And indeed, it was the power of God in Jesus that healed this woman. But faith was the channel through which Jesus' power worked. Her faith was so strong that she knew that if she could just get to Jesus, he would take care of the rest. And so she pushed aside all religious law, all the social conventions of the day, and she made her way toward Jesus. Now, it, it didn't bother her as she pushed through the crowd, touching those around her, because she was making them ritually unclean. And um, I, I think, actually, maybe that did bother her. I, I think I misspoke. It, it probably did bother her because she was making these people unclean. But yet, in her own heart, I think that she knew that was a minor inconvenience compared to her great suffering. So she pressed forward, reaching for her final hope with the sure knowledge that if she could just touch even the hem of Jesus' garment, she would be made well. Do you have that kind of faith? Is your faith so strong that it doesn't shy away even when confronted by the law or by social expectations or even by discouraging and doubtful voices? I think that from time to time, the kind of doubt that she experienced and, and that we all experience, um, I think that happens to all of us. But this woman with the hemorrhage exhibits a completely different kind of faith. It's a faith that every one of us needs to emulate. Now the challenge here, of course, is that we get this message that if our faith is strong enough, if we follow Christ in complete faith, then our greatest hopes and desires will be fulfilled and our illnesses will be made well. Our financial problems will be solved and there will be a roof over our heads, food on our tables. But we all know that things don't always work that perfectly in our lives. Even when we're praying, when we're fervently in total faith, our loved ones die despite their faith and all the faithful prayers that are lifted up on their behalf. And we lose our jobs to cutbacks, even after 30 years of faithful service and impeccable integrity on the job. Our children give in to peer pressure they waste away under the influence of drugs, and, and then they have these repeated trips to rehab only to solve the problem, perhaps temporarily. Life goes on, even when we hope for the best, even when we follow Christ in full, complete devotion. And here's what we need to know from this woman who has been bleeding for 12 years. When life goes on, when it seems that our faith is getting us nowhere, we have to keep pressing on anyway. We have to stay rooted in our faith, even still. Without being swayed or detracted by the pressures of this world that's all around us, we still have to pursue Christ with all that we have and all that we are. And sometimes such faith will deliver exactly what we've been hoping for. And we will once again receive that wonderful reassurance. But sometimes 
things will happen in a different way. Sometimes we will be hurt. Sometimes we'll be sad. Sometimes we're tempted to abandon our faith altogether. And yet, there is another lesson from this story of the bleeding woman. If we can keep the faith in all things, then Christ has the power not only to answer our greatest hopes and our greatest dreams sometimes, but to carry us through those times when everything else falls apart. We may not be able to physically touch Christ in the same way that this hemorrhaging woman was able to touch Christ, but if we'll follow her faithful example in our own lives, then Christ's power will touch us at the most amazing and wonderful ways. And that's the power of faith. My friends, it is the power of faith. Thanks be to God. May your faith carry you this day, through this time, into times of joy and into times when we can be together again. May God bless you. Amen. Our hymn is Blessed Assurance, found in your hymnal on page 369.
And now please join with me in our sending forth with the benediction. Go and serve with eagerness, with faith and love. We are one in Christ who died for us. There are people all around you who need your healing love. We commit ourselves to help as God gives us strength. Amen. Oh
of his hand.